Hello, everyone. We are now live. Welcome to our live stream. If you are tuning in, we are live right now on Twitch. We're live on Twitter. We are live on Facebook um, and on Mint Press News' YouTube channel. So we really appreciate you all joining us today. We have a really important discussion to talk about. Um, Facebook and Google and all Silicon Valley tech censorship of Palestinian voices and information online. So if you are joining us now and tuning in, my name is Manar Mohawish Adli. I'm the founder and editor in chief of MIT Press News. We really appreciate you joining us today. Um, we have a really impressive lineup today for our panel discussion where we're gonna talk about Israeli intelligence <laughs> collusion with Facebook and Google um, and altogether censorship of Palestinian voices online. And so what we like to do when we start all of our live streams and midcasts is to get everybody to share this live stream. So Sahir, you weren't with us when I was saying this, but if you can go on Facebook, share the Mint Press News live stream on your pages. If you're on Twitter to do the same thing, um, we are gonna do that right now. And if you haven't subscribed to us, please do so on our Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter account. So I'm gonna do that right now and share the live stream on Twitter and all the pages. All right, so we're gonna get started. Everybody share everything? Yeah. And this again is to help us beat social media algorithms, which is what our topic is uh, today. All right, so we're gonna get started now. So as the Israeli attacks on Gaza come to an end, supposedly through this new ceasefire announcement, <laughs> images of death and destruction are going viral on social media, causing worldwide outrage, but perhaps not as viral as they should be. As alongside the military onslaught, there's been a silent propaganda blitz against Palestinian voices, with big social media companies working hand in hand with Israel to try to soften the apartheid state's image and dampen or silence criticism. Silicon Valley has long had a close relationship with Israel, its intelligence services, and pro-Israel groups. On Friday, or on, on excuse me, on Facebook's advisory council, its former director general of the Israeli Ministry of justice, or not justice, uh, and state censor. Uh, her name is Emmy Palmore. While YouTube has partnered up with the ADL, or the Anti-Defamation League, which is a huge Islamophobic organization, <clears throat> moderate its content. Israeli intelligence has even infiltrated Microsoft and Facebook on deeper levels. Now, joining me today to discuss big tech censorship of Palestinian voices and the collusion between Israel and Silicon Valley are Mickey Huff, Suhair Nafel, and Jessica Boxbaum. Am I pronouncing your last name Jessica correctly? Boxbaum, but that, that's perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> um, Mickey Huff is a professor of social science and history at Diablo Valley College, California, and is director of the Media Freedom, Freedom Foundation Project and Project Censored. He hosts the Project Censored radio show. Uh, Suhair Nafel is a Palestinian American activist living in California. Earlier this year, he was taken to court by an IDF soldier who sought $6 million in damages after Suhair called her evil on Facebook. Bizarrely, the prosecution attempted to get the California judge to apply Israeli law to the post. Uh, Jessica is an Israeli-American journalist based in Jerusalem and a contributor to a Mint Press News. Her latest article is Facebook, Social Media Giants Admit to Silencing Palestinian Voices Online. You can find that at mintpressnews.com. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Um, I'm gonna start off with uh, Sohair. Here, this view. All right. We are gonna begin with Suhair. Suhair, you are one of the most courageous, active and outspoken Palestinian voices online. If people have not followed her, you definitely should now. Uh, but people like you are constantly facing flack, not only from pro-Israel people, but from social media companies themselves. Your Facebook page is constantly suspended, like so regularly, um, just like mine was earlier this week. Could you fill us in on the uphill battle Palestinians face uh, when talking online? You know, it's interesting. I, I question whether or not it's the actual, well, I, I believe social media, and I'm, I'm mainly on, on uh, Facebook. I do believe Facebook uh, sets up their algorithms, if that makes sense, such that anything we say as Palestinians that sounds like we are 
basically um, uh, criticizing Israel or anything having to do with Israel, I believe their algorithms are so uh, sensitive that whoever reports us get, can get us uh, blocked, essentially. And I believe there, you know, I, there's a group of God knows how many hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of folks who who don't want to you know they don't want to hear criticize uh, israel being criticized that are reporting us so i i'm not sure if it's the the facebook algorithms themselves or the facebook algorithms being triggered by people reporting us that's kind of what i'm, I'm a little uh unclear about but yes i believe i have people who watch <clears throat> my 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 ba my page and who literally comb through every comment i make every post i post i mean it is a full-time job they share my posts to to try to get them um taken down they they try to get me suspended 24 7. Uh, so i'm really watching everything i say it's almost like i can only speak in pg-13 <laughs> so that I don't trigger absolutely, and also all of my, you know, co-social media uh, activists as well. And that's what I encourage everybody: just speak as though you are on a, ch a children's show, <laughs> so, so that you don't get blocked. So that's sort of what I've been dealing with. Well, and it's funny that you say that because as censorship has taken this new face um, on, a, it's become so much more aggressive. We as activists and journalists have been finding ourselves having to self-censor what we're saying. We really like think twice, three times, four times before we make that post because we're like, oh my God, is this going to trigger uh, you know, my post to get flagged? Am I going to get canceled? Am I going to get censored? Is my page going to get taken down? It's a real, real problem yeah. uh, because it really is an issue of self-censorship. And so yeah. here you mentioned the, the mass flagging. Um, both you and I, uh, for me, it was the, really the first time, you know, in a long time that this happened to me, but it sounds like there's these like Hasbara, you know, bots <laughs> that are online, not bots, real people, uh, paid for by the state of Israel to mass flag Palestinian posts or anything that is, um, uh, that shows any sort of sympathy to Palestinian voices and their story. Mickey, are you surprised by what you hear from Sohair? Or is this basically a common story? And what sort of relationships do social media tech giants have with the U.S. and Israeli security states? Well, I'm. Thank you so much, Vinar. It's an honor to be here um, with you all and um, with our our wonderful panelists. Um, I'm afraid I'm not surprised by any of this. Um, in fact, the reason um, the Project Censored is a media watchdog group founded in 1976. Um, we basically look at news that doesn't make the news and analyze why. Um, so over the years, um, this has just been a recurring theme for us. We've had umpteen stories about Palestine, Palestinians, Israeli attacks on Palestine, Israeli violation of international law. I mean, if I was here, you know, if I spent the next 45 minutes, I maybe wouldn't still be done with listing the number of stories and incidents and issues that the corporate press and the Western press just don't or won't cover. And if and when they do, it's very biased. There was a great piece by Gregory Shupak in Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting the other day that looked at the both sides-ism and the false equivalency of the way that the corporate media handles uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issues of apartheid. Uh, and they can't even usually bring themselves to use those kind of words because they historically have great impact, right, for anybody that has a memory. We do live in the United States of amnesia, as Gore Vidal would say. Um, but it's really important to bring these issues to the forefront uh, because there is a concerted effort to shape this narrative. There is an extraordinary effort both in front and on, in fr on the front lines as well as behind the scenes algorithmically. And we just heard allusions to that moments ago um, where uh, folks that are writing about these kind of sensitive issues and topics um, because they definitely go against the powers that be, um, NATO, US foreign policy, um, we'll get into that maybe in a second. Um, we find ourselves in, in sort of like this minefield of censorship detection, right? That if you say the wrong word or say the wrong thing, it triggers something. Look, I'm talking to you, Manar Mahawish, Adley. Um, Mint Press News has been under attack again. Mint Press News has disappeared and come back again and again. Project Censored has been the uh, subject of various online attacks because people just do not want to hear um, these kinds of narratives and stories. So we're up against, um, you know, a real serious juggernaut of sensorial control. 
and it's not it's not necessarily the same as old fashioned um, uh, government censorship, although that clearly is going on here. Um, but this is corporate censorship uh, because these social media platforms and big big tech out of Silicon Valley, these are private companies that say, well, we have proprietary algorithms and we have, um, you know, we, we have our public, our, our um, business policies. And these are the things that we, you have to follow in order to play, you know, play on our platforms. Well, I just want to really quickly go and talk about how this isn't their platform. It's right. this amounts to censorship by proxy. Facebook, Twitter, Apple, Google, YouTube, the alphabet soup of um, these surveillance companies masquerading as other things. Um, these are mass data collectors and surveillers. Let's not forget where they all got their beginning, going back to the, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. Um, DARPA is a, was a U.S. lab that works with the Pentagon, the CIA, the NSA, multiple other agencies, other countries, born during the Cold War after the Soviet Union launched, launched Sputnik in 1957. And basically they said, we're not going to get scooped technologically. We're not going to get surprised again. And DARPA has been one of the innovation sources behind everything from the Internet to drones, self-driving cars, and, and mass surveillance tools like GPS all originally designed for military purposes with public money purportedly for the public good. So you can't really divorce these alleged private companies in Silicon Valley with public monies and public interest with the right for oversight. So when these companies say, well, the government can't censor, that's the first amendment, but we can do what we want and we're curating information. Oh, making... And I want to be <clears throat> very dangerous, very dangerous about the deplatforming that's going on and the cancel culture Watching that's us and that's going on. You cut out for like about 30 seconds there, Mickey. You cut out. Oh, sorry about that. I was rambling on about DARPA, right? Yeah. Um, and DARPA is, of course, the force behind a lot of this kind of censorship and surveillance. Censorship and surveillance go hand in hand. And just very quickly, I'll hand it off. Um, I just wanted to point out something that we learned from Edward Snowden, right? The NSA whistleblower. And Snowden uh, aptly put this, and I, again, that's why I'm going to kind of quote what he said. He said, Facebook's data policies are exploitative and resemble the work of a surveillance company. He said, these companies were just as untrustworthy as the NSA. And on Twitter, he remarked a couple years ago, businesses that make money by collecting and selling detailed records of private lives were once plainly described as surveillance companies. Their rebranding as social media is the most successful deception since the Department of War became the Department of Defense. So just unpacking some of those things, when we talk about social media, this isn't just the place where you share your dinner with your aunt and uncle. It's a place where you're willingly sharing all kinds of information to then be manipulated algorithmically in terms of what you see, hear, and even say, and who gets to see it. So it's a real big problem, this kind of digital censorship. And I'm, I'm glad to see that more and more people are talking about it. Yeah, and we, we, you and I just did that panel for um, the Real News Network, specifically about surveillance capitalism. And we talked about we talked about all of this in so much detail, so I'm glad that we have you on this panel today. Um, Jessica, you recently investigated how social media uh, tech giants like Facebook have been actively silencing Palestinian voices, speaking up um, against the recent uh, Israeli incursion and, and onslaught in Gaza, and they actually admitted to you that they were taking down posts. Can you talk to us about your, your report and what you found out? Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, also thank you uh, for uh, this. This is great to be here with everyone. Um, yeah, so they did say to me, oh, uh, technical errors, uh, both uh, Twitter and Facebook, blaming this on technical errors, saying that they're very sorry, you know, Facebook, uh, which owns Instagram saying, um, you know, we, we didn't mean for this to happen. We didn't, our intention was not to uh, suppress Palestinian voices or Palestinian information online. Um, but it's still going on uh, and it continues to go on. I wrote this report um, maybe what, like a week ago or something. Um, and just today, AMLA, the uh, Arab Center for uh, Development uh, Social Media, released a report today saying that they received from the 6th of May until uh, the 19th of May yesterday, 500 reports uh, from users 
about, you know, social media suppression of their information, uh, you know, suspending accounts, uh, deactivated accounts, uh, limited reach. This is still something that continues to happen even now. And um, there's so much, you know, social media, especially Facebook, um, the uh, Palestinians, especially here in Palestine, use Facebook so much to get out their voice and to get out their mes message. And they're not being able to do that, whether their accounts are being deactivated, their posts are being, uh, you know, flagged, um, associated with hate speech or violating community standards. Meanwhile, you have uh, Zionists, Israeli settlers here in Palestine organizing on WhatsApp, Telegram, these lynching mobs to go to cities in Palestine and organizing lynching mobs actually doing hate speech, you know? So they're, and they're not getting uh, as much uh, monitoring or moderation from these social media companies as um, a Palestinian who talks about anti-Zionism or who talks just about Israeli police violence that they're experiencing at Al-Aqsa. Um, so, you know, there's this huge discrepancy uh, going on between uh, the Israeli settlers and these violent uh, Zionists versus just Palestinian activists online. Absolutely. I, I really like the point that you make that, you know, the real anti-Semitism, the real racism, the real uh, hate speech is being organized by these Israeli settlers who are organizing lynch mobs to go stab Palestinians to go burn their houses down, to go kill Palestinian babies. That's the real violence. And yet Facebook is allowing that kind of content, but then monitoring um, the kind of content from Palestinians who are just posting what they're living through from these violent mobs and from the state of Israel and the apartheid and the occupation that they're living through. So that is yet a really great example of how social media giants are not working to create a place for the free flow of information, but to work in the interests of uh, government, the US government, the US military machine, the weapons manufacturers like Raytheon, Lockheed Martin and Boeing, the bomb, those are the companies with the bombs, the arms makers that are being dropped um, on the people of Gaza. And so that's where the interests lie for social media uh, tech giants. Um, so here on your Facebook page, you recently called social media Israel's biggest ex existential threat. Could you explain the danger decentralized media plays to the government of Israel? You know, while I I find it absolutely, uh, you know, appalling that we are being censored to this extent and pretty much, you know, backing everything you are all saying, um, I also find it... <laughs> interesting that the very tool that they are using uh, to, to silence us has been the tool that we've been able to use to expose them. So yes, yes there has been ridiculous censorship, but also I give social media, Facebook, you know, all the platforms so much credit for the, the major seismic shift that we just all experience in terms of how much solidarity we have received, Palestinians have received within the past several weeks from mainstream media actually, um, from celebrities, from hip hop artists, actors, <laughs> politicians. And so I credit social media uh, for bringing us to where we are now. Obviously we still have a long road ahead and a, and a heavy battle ahead, but social media is their biggest threat in addition to BDS. You know, social media is, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> you know, nonviolent resistance. That's how I see it, just like BDS is. And so, yeah, we're just going to keep it, we're just going to keep it going. I mean, for every account that's being de deactivated, we create another 10 accounts. Uh, right. So the censorship can, can keep going. It can keep getting uh, more stringent, more... Um, aggressive, but we're, <laughs> we're not going anywhere, right? We're just going to keep, we're just going to keep posting and keep sharing because all we're doing is we're sharing the truth. We're showing images, videos of, of 
actual facts. We're not, we're not spinning, we're not lying. And thank God, thank God the world has finally seen it the, the way, you know, it, it's been exposed the way it should be. And we just have to keep it going. Well, you make a really good point. And there's a lot of benefits to social media. I mean, that's how a lot of revolutions have basically <laughs> been broadcasted live for the public to see. So <laughs> Mickey, <laughs> talk to me about that. What, what, what do we do here? Which is also why they're mass surveillance machines. Right, right, so right. yes, everything that we've just heard is true. Yeah. And social, here we ironically are on one of these yeah, platforms, yeah. right? <laughs> And I get yeah, right. And, you know, Project Censored has had their issues with censorship on social media. We've had issues with censorship over at Wikipedia. We've, you know, we've called it out everywhere. We've seen it. And as a result, you know, sometimes people do target or come after us as an organization. But that's very different than what's happening with Palestinians. Um, these people are literally being targeted with their lives. Um, the attack on the uh, AP and Al Jazeera is a war crime. They, uh, Israel just destroyed that building, claiming Hamas was there. And the AP, you know, AP and Reuters haven't done stellar reporting on these issues. But I was heartened to see many journalists around the world come out uh, of their, their, you know, from silence to say, you know what? We don't usually talk about this issue, but you can't just go bombing the messengers here. I mean, right. that was targeted deliberately to silence major platform voices in the region so that we have to rely on the ground to people telling the stories. And we know the corporate media don't go into Gaza and tell those stories. Abby Martin, Gaza Fights for Freedom, you know, she had trouble even getting in. They were they tell their stories, but if there's no one way to get the message out and they're suppressed on social media platforms, no no one really can hear it to challenge the massive top-down propaganda that's been part uh, of of the steady US narrative, NATO narrative, you're going back well over half a century. And, you know, that gets into these other big tech companies and that gets into things like how the Atlantic Council, the PR wing of NATO, is a fact checker for Facebook. Um, you know, take a look at who's on the boards of some of these places. Andy Roth and I wrote about this. Some of these people also work with companies like NewsGuard, <laughs> right, that you've talked about, Menar, um, and Whitney Webb has talked about. And I know you wanted to talk about Election Guard a little bit. But just take a look at who's on the boards of these places just quickly. NewsGuard, for example, that gives news ratings. So Mint Press News gets a red flag, right? Um, but CNN and Fox and everybody else, they're green lights. Those are great sources, according to NewsGuard. Well, who the hell is NewsGuard? Michael Hayden, who ran the CIA under George Bush. Leo Hendry from AT&T. Kate O'Sullivan, uh, the manager for digital diplomacy at Microsoft. Members of NATO, Tom Ridge, the first Homeland Security <laughs> Secretary. Like, these aren't neutral observers. These are shills from government, and these are shills for Western, pro-Western NATO propaganda that is pro-Zionist, pro-Israel, anti-Palestinian, anti-human rights. And anybody that questions it or gets in their way gets steamrolled, censored, or gets labeled, Right. Labeling and ad hominems are the worst. Guilt by association. It's almost impossible to have sober c conversations about these subjects without being labeled an anti-Semite, without being labeled a terrorist, without being labeled some kind of pawn of Hamas. Where are the people labeling the Atlantic Council? Where are the people labeling DARPA? Where Yasha Levine, of course, um, Surveillance Valley. But where where are those folks? So we have an incredibly skewed conversation here. Yes, yes, yes. Who's back back in the fact? I didn't mean to interrupt you, Mickey. I just wanted to make that point. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. You, that, I'm, I think the point is made, and that's really part of the problem with these narratives. Who right. is checking the fact checkers? Who does get to decide? You've got people at CNN between Stelzer and Blitzer. Um, you know, they, they went over and were actually almost blaming reporters for being victims of the bombing of the AP building. And, and Blitzer has a past with APAC in the Israeli lobby. Right. Meanwhile, you got people like Mark Lamont Hill getting sacked at CNN, all because he bothered to mention that Palestinians are human beings. Um, Michael Che on Saturday Night Live, you know, on Weekend Update, the fake news satire program. 
He gives a joke nod that Palestinians are people and gets finger wagged and almost gets canceled in a week. Right. That's how extraordinary this bias is in this country and in the West. And one last piece of the puzzle that I wanted to bring up that goes back more to the old legacy media, the BBC. And I, I was reminded of this the other day when I was talking to Abby Martin, who you just had on. John Pilger, the documentarian in the film, The War You Don't See. If you haven't seen it, see it. It was the film you didn't see here because the, the alleged First Amendment group, the Landon Foundation, canceled its premiere over a decade ago. Um, and they threw him under the bus. But in the movie, The War You Don't See, John Pilger was interviewing one of the editors at the BBC, right? And in that region, the BBC is considered some, some uh, hallmark of, of great journalism. And, and I'm not saying they don't do good journalism. They do on occasion. But when it comes to Israel-Palestine, they're completely in the tank for uh, Israel. And Pilger asked one of the editors at the BBC, said, why don't you tell any of the stories from inside Palestine? Why do you only tell the, the Israeli perspective? And you could see on film that the BBC editor was, she was flummoxed, right? She was kind of like, what are you asking me? And he said, well, why don't you do a journalistic expose where you get other people's voices in Palestine? And she said, that's not our job. Let them get their own journalists to tell their own stories. Straight from the horse's mouth at the BBC. So, you know, you don't need to see, uh, you know, critics. You don't need to go read Electronic Intifada and Ali Abu Nima and Nora Baris Friedman, right, to see them finger wagging at the censors across the world. You can just go to the BBC and listen to their own editors tell you that they don't care about those perspectives. And that in and of itself is not, not journalism. It's propaganda. And it's costing people's lives, and that's one of the ultimate tragedies here with this kind of censorship is that it suppresses these narratives that are calling out the apartheid state, calling out violence that violates the Geneva Conventions. And that, there should be nothing controversial about that other than the effort to stop how we stop it, right? Anybody calling it out shouldn't be uh, finger wagged. People pointing it out shouldn't be shot at or bombed. Right. Those people should be elevated and they should have a front and center voice to mobilize other people in the West to stop financing this slaughter in the largest open air prison in the world. We now finally have a couple of people in Congress that are trying to stop, you know, a nearly billion dollar weapons package going to Israel They're the number one recipient of, of U.S. aid and weapons. And it's just like with Saudi Arabia. We have blood on our hands in Palestine, just like in Yemen. And if people are concerned about that, they shouldn't be afraid about speaking up. And now is the time to speak up, call us, and call your local media representative and get this story to the public. Absolutely. We should be doing more than pro protesting is obviously major. We're seeing this unprecedented wave of support for Palestinian human rights that have basically, <laughs> I mean, they've spread across the whole globe. And I think that's so amazing. But we need to go even further in putting pressure on the machine itself, the military machine itself. We need to be at the doors of Lockheed Martin. We have to be at the doors of the Atlantic Council, of Facebook, of Instagram. I really believe that we need to be there at their doors and putting pressure uh, where pressure needs to be and put pressure on influencers to talk about these issues as well. Um, and so the fight obviously continues. And just to talk a little bit about um, censorship that we faced at Mint Press News, um, you know, right now, our website has been attacked for the last 48 hours. Um, first time in a long time that we've been getting uh, attacked and, and by hackers. And uh, I kind of suspect that it's because of our a bit of aggressive coverage of Israel's onslaught in Gaza. And so that's why it's so important to support independent media like Mint Press News um, and Project Censored because um, we are really up against this Goliath of a military machine that has its proxies within corporate media, its hackers, its whatever it is on social media. I mean, this is a real, real fight for truth. Um, and the reason why uh, big tech and the military industrial complex is hammering so hard on Palestinian voices and anti-war voices as well is because they know the strength of our voice. They know uh, how powerful it is to show the human side, the human suffering of uh, the war machine. Uh, the media likes to paint all of these conflicts through the lens of, you know, uh, religious or, you know, they hate us for our freedom or these people are barbaric, uncivilized. When in reality, all of these conflicts, not just Palestine, but in Yemen and 
in, in uh, you know, all the countries that the United States is waging a sanctions war against, it's occupying, it's extracting its minerals and its resources. All of these conflicts are rooted in Western colonialism and imperialism, and it's for profit to the 1% class. And if we, because we independent journalists and activists present it through that lens, we are being targeted. Um, another really interesting point uh, that you made, Nikki, is about the war in Yemen. Uh, when we were covering Yemen quite aggressively for the last, you know, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, where 23 million uh, Yemenis face mass starvation and famine that could literally die at any moment now, uh, when we were showing images of skeletal children starving in Yemen. Facebook was flagging our posts as uh, violating their terms of service and providing a respectful and positive experience on social media, while Trump <laughs> tweeting out like racist shit on Twitter, <laughs> like calling for genocide, uh, you know, against people around the world. And so just the irony, so much irony. And then Carlos Lacouf, he's this amazing, brilliant, uh, internationally renowned cartoonist. He works for Mint Press. I'm so proud and honored, you know, to be working with him and for all the work that he's done. He was depicting uh, the Great Return March, the snipers that were targeting journalists and medics. And we posted this cartoon showing uh, these um, uh, these snipers targeting these innocent people, journalists and medics. And uh, we were flagged and censored for those cartoons, and those were accused of being anti-Semitic. Well, what's really anti-Semitic are the Palestinian people that are being targeted and slaughtered who are unarmed during that great return march. Mickey, you sound like you want to say something. Or look oh, like I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I mean, every just everything that you're saying, unfortunately, needs to be said over and over again, right? Um, you don't get to quote George W. Bush all the time, uh, but when you do, I like to go back to one of his speeches that he gave where he actually... Uh, it's one of those moments where they say the truth out loud in front of a microphone. Yeah. And he was talking about, um, in order for the truth to sink in, he said, in my line of work, you've got to repeat things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in. You've got to kind of catapult the propaganda. Propaganda, yeah. Well, that was true about WMDs. It was true about Islam, Islamic terrorism. It's true about Hamas. It's true. They, the message has been repeated over and over and over and over again. And one of the things that we also need to do is we need to keep repeating every single person that's here. And I know that they've already done this. You got to keep repeating it over and over and over again, as many places as possible. And that's why censorship and deplatforming and cancel culture online is so detrimental because these are the very kinds of voices and narratives that are turned off or tuned out. Right. And that's why this is why we can't cheer when anybody is being censored in exactly. these platforms, exactly. because the next time you turn around, it's going to happen to you. Right. Right. And just so I want to know you that you're on the ground, Andrew, right now, uh, as the ceasefire was announced in the last um, uh, it was announced and taken into effect in the last 24 hours. But now we have Israeli police. Um, throwing uh, stun grenades and uh, tear gas at worshippers, at Palestinian worshippers at Al-Aqsa Mosque, where Palestinians are, for the first time since Ramadan ended, are actually finally trying to celebrate Eid al-Fitr. Can you tell me what you're seeing on the ground and how people are reacting there? Yeah, I mean, that was just uh, breaking news, uh, maybe in the last few hours, that uh, the Israeli police are firing stun grenades, rubber bullets, attacking again. You know, this happened during the last days of Ramadan, attacking Palestinian worshippers again, and attacking Palestinians who are, who are you know, celebrating or happy about that we uh, have a ceasefire going on right now. Um, and then I believe even tonight, so, you know, there are protests happening um, in Sheikh Jarrah constantly, uh, all the time. And again, it's most likely that the Israeli police will be cracking down on the protesters um, at Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, tonight, I am sure, because they always do their Friday demonstrations, um, and we will see the same uh, level of violence. I've spoken 
to uh, residents of Sheikh Jarrah, and I visited Sheikh Jarrah recently, and you just smell the skunk water. Their homes are being sprayed with skunk water. They're having uh, stun grenades uh, firing at them. These are demonstrators who are nonviolent. All they're trying to do is get the message and the word out, and the police and also satellites are attacking them. Um, and people are fearing for their lives um, in occupied East Jerusalem, around Sheikh Jarrah, all for trying to just broadcast that uh, this forcible displacement of Palestinians from their homes um, that they've been living in since the 1950s. Um, that is all that is happening. And we're just constantly seeing the Israeli state violence continuing um, and trying to suppress Palestinian voices. Um, but it's it's such resilience to see uh, to see Palestinians on the ground not give up hope and continue to demonstrate despite everything that, you know, despite the arrests and the horrific violence that they encounter, they continue to go out in the streets. And I'm curious to know about what you're seeing on Israeli state TV. I mean, we're used to like the propaganda here, the soft propaganda here, but how is Israeli state TV compared, you know, broadcasting and reporting about the violence? Like, what are they saying? Do you see the racism within the way that they're reporting as well? Yes, I mean, um, it's all Israeli media. I mean, maybe the only one would be Haaretz, uh, who's a little bit more left of center. Um, but mostly it's just talking about, uh, you know, Arabs as terrorists. Um, yeah, you know, like uh, affiliating with uh, uh, that all Palestinians are terrorists, that, um, you know, can, saying free Palestine or free Gaza from Hamas, um, talking about things like that, uh, just being very much one sided um, and talking probably more about the Israeli civilians who have died. And it's not to say that that isn't a problem, but honestly, if you just even look at the numbers, I mean, uh, we had close to what, 230, maybe more than 230 Palestinians died in Gaza from Israel's assault um, in the last 10 days, 65 children. So compared to what, 12 Israelis, maybe two kids, um, who died um, in on this side, that's nothing. And this continues to always happen of seeing such difference in numbers of the death and destruction that Palestinians face compared to what Israelis face. Um, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like the Israeli media are basically ramping up the public Israeli support for the right-wing ideology that all Arabs represent, or all Palestinians. First of all, they don't even say they're Palestinian, they call them Arabs. Yeah. Like, these are Palestinian people who are the indigenous inhabitants of this land, and they refer to them as Arabs, they refer to them as uh, basically represent, uh, uh, Hamas representatives. And they use this ideology of every single Palestinian in Gaza is a human shield to Hamas, which basically ramps up that support, that racist ideology that all Palestinians are militant. When we're seeing all of these images coming out of independent media and alternative media, humanizing the Palestinian men who are just trying to soothe their children so gently to get them to calm down from the Israeli bombs that are raining down on them, uh, the Palestinian mothers who are just protecting their, their children like any other yeah. people in the world would be doing. But yet Israeli media continues to portray Palestinians as militants. And, you know, the, one of those viral videos that have, have that have gone viral is from Abby Martin, who, where she interviewed people on Jaffa Street, on, you know, Shara Yaffa. She's just interviewing people, Israelis, regular everyday Israelis, and she posted every single one of her interviews in this video, this compilation that went viral. And every single one of these Israelis said, we need to carpet bomb Palestinian Arabs. We need to kill them. We need to get them out of our land. We need to just 
Like it's so genocidal the way that they are speaking and thinking of Palestinians. It's so disgusting. And it's really, really scary because I spoke to, you know, I'm a Palestinian American. I spoke to some of my family in Jerusalem and they're afraid to leave their homes right now because of these Israeli lynch moms that are organizing on social media on WhatsApp because uh, these lynch mobs are ready to kill, maim, burn down anything Palestinian. Um, so here, the ceasefire has just been announced. Israeli police are already targeting worshippers in, in uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, tell me, what has Israel done to the, you know, you are a Palestinian Christian, which I feel like, you know, Palis let's talk about censorship. Palestinians in general are censored, but Palestinian Christians are like erased from the entire narrative. Palestinian Christians are, you know, make up such a huge population of the Palestinian uh, population. And I want to hear more about how Israel has targeted Palestinian Christians in Gaza and in Jerusalem to engage in I mean, ethnic cleansing. They see us all in the same lens. I mean, they don't care that there are Christians. We're still all terrorists to them, right? So, and yes, they, they don't want to uh, allow, you know, they, they'd rather not people like myself remind the world that we exist, that, you know, 20% of the 14 plus million Palestinians in the world are Christian. Uh, and so in terms of how the Palestinians are being treated in East Jerusalem and, you know, this very small population in Gaza and pretty much all over Palestine in the West Bank, they don't care. I mean, they, they don't, you know, it is, it is an assault on Palestinians in general. So um, unfortunately, there are not a huge population of Palestinian Christians left in Palestine all over um, as a result of the occupation. Uh, but my family members are targeted just like any Palestinian Muslim, uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> folks who are being being oppressed and, and, and occupied. So there's no difference. And that's why I make it a point to always remind folks that I exist, Palestinian Christians exist, and we stand very closely side by side in unity with our Muslim brothers and sisters. There is no difference between us. And that's, that's what makes us special as a people and, and Palestinian Jews as well. Absolutely. And I think that's so important to recognize because, um, you know, Palestinians, as I mentioned before, are painted as through this very Islamophobic lens. But, you know, who's erased are Palestinian Christians who are standing with Palestinian Muslims together. They're praying together. They're marching together. They're organizing together in Palestine, in Gaza uh, and Israel's recent assault on the Gaza Strip. Um, Israel destroyed a historic a uh, sister school for Palestinian Christian women to study. And yet right. this is not even mentioned in mainstream yeah. corporate media because it doesn't fit the narrative that all Palestinians are Hamas human shields, that yeah. all Palestinians are militant. It doesn't fit that yeah. narrative. And then we see instances where Israel is using literal Palestinian Christians as human shields at the Bethlehem uh, church where Jesus was born. And so we have so many instances of this. And then there are instances of Palestinian Jews who are also have been erased from the conversation, who don't even live there anymore. And yet they stand with Palestinian Muslims and Christians <laughs> together to organize it. And, ch and churches, th churches throughout Jerusalem are, are being targeted and set on fire and vandalized. And priests were attacked uh, out of the Armenian quarter. Uh, just there was a report a couple of days ago, several priests were actually assaulted and attacked um, by, by Zionist settlers. Uh, so to your point, absolutely. They don't they, they don't care. I mean, they, to us, you know, to them, we're not human. We're Palestinians. So but right. that's going to change soon. Absolutely. <laughs> that's the power. That's, that's the hope that I love. Yeah, um, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. I'm not worried about it. Uh, Mickey, I know that you have to go soon, so I just want to ask you, um, you know, your final question. If you can talk about uh, the media coverage when it comes to Palestinian Christians in terms of, like, U.S. Christian support for Israel. Like, it's so ironic because, like, Suhair, who's a Palestinian Christian, like, her roots are directly tied to Jesus Christ, right, in comparison to the Christians anywhere else. 
Well, as we go back to the neoconservative ascendancy in the late 90s, right, through the Project for New American Century and the George W. Bush uh, illegitimate presidency of that whole period um, where he wasn't elected either, um, Christian Zionism is a big thing in the West. Um, I'm probably the only non-religious person maybe on the panel, more secular humanist. Um, but from my vantage point, none of that should, none of this yeah. should matter. Whether you're a Palestinian Christian or whether you worship Martians or, or not at all. That, it, it, that, that, it, it, it's irrelevant yeah. to the question at hand. And that Absolutely. is, do human beings have the right to peaceably exist and live their lives um, under whatever uh, philosophies and systems of belief that, that they so choose so long as they're not harming other people? I mean, what happened to just this core fundamental human value? You know, you know, and if you want to talk about religion, then you want to talk about the big three. That, don't they all go back to the same place? Um, don't they all purportedly have some similar principles? Well, those get thrown to the wayside, and that's very unfortunate. And the corporate press in, in, in the West in particular, um, they never want to point that out. They always go to the negative bias. They always want to stoke flames of, of discontent. They always need an us-them mentality. Um, Edward Said, of course, laid that out years ago. Um, and, and, and so we get a cartoonish impression, really. Most people pay no attention to this stuff other than what flashes quickly on their phones or on the CNN or Fox or whatever brand of information they choose. I got an idea. How about you have a brand of information based on truth and transparent factual reporting? Let's start with that. And look, any, as soon as you start looking at some, through a critical media literacy lens at this issue and the way the media covers Israel-Palestine, you can discover almost immediately the extraordinary bias, the extraordinary false equivalency, and the complicity of the Western press in war crimes. And I'm reminded again and again that in the Western press, even at Reuters and other places like AP, um, it's always a clash, a conflict. Um, you know, and, and we never really hear, we hear like, well, people are being killed. Well, you don't hear that 97% of the injuries being suffered in the last couple of weeks are all Palestinians. You don't hear the reality of it. And by the way, those people that are being killed wantonly in their homes, their families are trading each other's kids so that in case their house is wiped out, their whole family lineage doesn't get wiped out. By the way, they're hiding in these, in these homes under bombs while, while, Many of them have no running or potable water. Many of them don't have electricity or internet for more than a few hours a day, if that. Why is that not reported in the Western press? Well, I'll tell you why, and it's exactly what we just discussed and what the other panelists have been saying. It humanizes people. I, and I'm saying this from the perspective that we have effectively dehumanized ourselves. And our media culture constantly does this. It constantly plays games with hierarchies and us and them narratives. And one of the big things that critical media literacy can do and help people understand the importance of social justice narratives is one of the ideas of equity. Who is being treated how? How does the media treat people as heroes or victims? How, whose voice is heard and whose is not being heard? And look, in the case of what's happening in Palestine, there couldn't be a more textbook case of propaganda and demonization, all of which goes against Article 19 of the Declaration of Human Rights that was signed after World War II, after the scourge of the Nazis. And it said that people have the right to be heard. People have the right to media. People have the right to be the media. And people's voices cannot and should not be suppressed, of course, worst of all, by violence. And again, we really need to kind of get back to some of those basic principles and practice them. We need more independent outlets and more voices coming out of these regions of the world that we are routinely demonizing and destroying. And we need to take back control of the narrative. And we need to not be afraid to speak up when people are parroting what they heard at the New York Times or parroting what they heard on Fox News. In the United States, there's rarely agreement on many things. But unfortunately, there's a lot of agreement about Israel v. Palestine, right? That's because the propaganda on this subject is so pervasive. 
We need to pierce those hyperpartisan bubbles. We need to go back to the human narratives and we need to go back to telling the truth about what's actually happening on the ground in this part of the world. And we need to put an end to the Israeli apartheid state and we need to support any movement that will pressure the US government and its NATO allies to hold both Israel and Saudi Arabia accountable for war crimes committed in the region to the profits of the US military industrial complex. Absolutely. And, you know, those principles that you mentioned for human rights and people having a, vo a right to have a voice, to be heard, you know, to, to have access to media. It's almost like our, our social media giants are going against every single one of those values. <laughs> Ironically, here yes. in the free, uh, in this beacon of democracy, in this beacon of, you know, human rights and First Amendment rights and right. journalism and you know, all of those principles that we believe we stand for, yet every single one of those principles are being squashed upon by those social media tech giants. Uh, Mickey, I know you have to go, so if you want to exit out, you can go right ahead. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, Mickey. I'm going to ask uh, Sohair and Jessica just one last question. So, um, Sohair, I want you to talk a little bit about, um, hold on, let me get Mickey out of here. There you go. <laughs> uh, if you will, I would love if you could talk to us about um, the lawsuit that was waged against you, that was filed, not waged, filed against you by the IDF soldier. Can you start us from the beginning, from your Facebook post, who this IDF soldier is, what she did, and then just a brief like explanation of this court case? Um, during the summer of 2018, the moment that Razan uh, El Najjar was assassinated, the young nurse in Gaza who was um, out in the field, uh, she was an, uh, in EMT trying to help the Palestinians who were peacefully protesting in Gaza, the March of Return. When she was sniped and murdered, that was huge news. It went international. Of course, I was on Facebook along with everybody posting about it and, and being outraged about it. And there was a moment where I saw a share on Facebook from the IDF page. One of my uh, Facebook friends shared a post from the IDF page. And this particular post had a picture of this young gal who was an American who went to Israel to join the, I the IDF. She was standing there with a rifle and the IDF uh, caption uh, was basically bragging about how she came as uh, a um, an educator and has now uh, decided to join in the field. So she was, you know, there's I guess there's an educational department in in the in, in the IDF, and so she's she's leaving that and and going to the field. And of course, the 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 person who shared it was outraged. His caption. Uh, triggered me and of course I wanted to share it as well but rather than actually sharing that post off of the public page for the IDF I took the picture of this young gal I posted it alongside with the picture of Razan and I basically made a comparison between this young gal who's 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 in you know he's who's an American and the IDF to basically contribute in the into the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians and how Razan is this you know, this young gal who's, you know, who's, who's just living her life to save others. And the, it was, it was purely a comparison. Some of my Facebook followers misunderstood. I have a lot of international Facebook followers and they um, changed the verbiage of my post, uh, of my caption and it wrote that it was this young woman who actually assassinated Razan, which it wasn't the case. That particular information went viral. It was shared millions of times. It was shared um, by public Facebook pages and social media that had hundreds of thousands of followers. And so the misinformation just caught fire essentially. Uh, and so she was harassed. Um, and and at, the, at the time, I, we didn't even know that she was no longer with the IDF. The actual post was an older post that was shared that moment at, the, at that day. So that came and went. And two and a half years later, I was handed a $6 million <laughs> lawsuit for defamation by this young woman and uh, who was represented by, you know, uh, an extremely powerful organization out of Israel who, uh, you know, they were very, very aggressive and they, they were basically trying to <laughs> implement Israeli laws to, you know, 
to 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 change laws here in California for for uh, a statute of limitation because there, we have in California the statute of limitation for lawsuits for defamation lawsuits are are a year. Uh, two and a half years later, that statute of limitation ran out. One and two, they didn't have a case to begin with. Uh, but their statute of limitation is seven years in Israel. So they're trying to implement and basically bully our our justice system here in California to change the uh, statute of limitation for defamation from one year to seven years and, and move forward on that. And of course, six months, it took six months uh, for the judge to finally do Obviously, what any any judge of sound mind would do is he dismissed the case, and he also awarded me a, an anti-slap motion, meaning uh, they were punished for even bringing this <laughs> this suit, and they, you know, she is responsible for paying my legal fees. So it was a great victory, and it needed to happen. So I was going to say that sounds like a victory for yourself and for Palestinian activists online, yeah. and it does sound like that judge was, you know, level-headed and was not bullied because I, I know that those groups that represent these IDF soldiers um, are bullies. They're really yeah. aggressive and they, Extremely. you know, they've, they've got big egos and they feel like they run the place. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and they're trying actually breaking news. They're, they're, they're filing for an appeal of, Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. They, like they made it. Yeah. They, they noticed, uh, or they sent a notice for, um, for, uh, you know, an appeal. So that'll be interesting to see. So yeah, they're, they're just relentless and they're, they're desperate and they know they're losing. Um, they know that the, the narrative is no longer flying. Their, their, um, their story is no longer sticking. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a process and we're just going to keep fighting and, and, and uh, pushing, pushing forward. So. Absolutely. Well, it does sound like they're relentless, and we, we obviously support you, uh, Suhair, in your fight against this. Um, one final question for Jessica. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about censorship in the United States by these big tech social media giants, but in Palestine, Palestinians can, can't even wave a flag. They can't even post on Facebook. It's illegal for them to engage in, in activism online. Yet they do, and they continue, and they organize. But can you, Jessica, talk to me about what is legal and not legal for Palestinians to post on social media, and what are the you know what are the consequences for Palestinians? Like, what have you seen and heard on the ground? I mean, so first off, um, just talking about um, not an online space. So, for instance, it is illegal to raise the Palestinian flag in Jerusalem. Most recently, um, when Christians going into the old city uh, of Easter celebrations, um, there were, I think, one or two people who were arrested for raising the Palestinian flag. So that is something that, um, you know, happens just within the physical space. Online, I will say, you know, I'm it's just more that they will be targeted by, like we mentioned, the Israeli troll armies um, that we have online. Um, uh, many groups who just go and try and flag content by Palestinians. And then you also have the Israeli government. They have the uh, Israeli cyber unit that I believe is part of the Ministry of Justice. Basically, one of their duties is to send just requests to uh, Facebook saying this incites uh, violence, this is inciting violence, or it's hate speech, it's anti Semitism, using words just simply like the words of violence and somehow um, hate speech and getting their accounts deactivated and uh, uh, their posts not having as much reach, um, just being considered somehow like a terrorist online for talking about Zionism. Um, and they get arrested very for this kind of activity online, right? They get arrested for this kind of activity, right? Like, do does the Israeli yeah. military films for these posts? Um, so what I've really seen is a lot of the times. Um, Palestinian students or Palestinian activists online who talk about uh, what's going on may then end up ha getting their homes raided and arrested. So a couple of years, um, there's been huge targets 
uh, Ramallah um, in the occupied West Bank uh, of uh, IDF soldiers going and arresting uh, Palestinian students there. And um, I've spoken with sources on the ground and they feel that sometimes it's just because they might be active on the Palestinian experience about the Israeli occupation. And then all of a sudden they are uh, targeted by Israeli forces, arrested and put into uh, military detention. Um, so, you know, these, these sort of things happen a lot and it's really, really just um, talking, talking about the occupation online can uh, criminalize you um, and you can be, yeah, thrown in jail for, for doing that. Absolutely. And the former director general of the Israeli Ministry of Justice and official state censor, um, and I don't know if I'm butchering this name or not, but it's Emmy Palmore. She has joined Facebook as an official censor. Uh, well, not, I mean, she joined Facebook's free speech advisory board, which is so ironic because she is actually responsible for censoring and purging uh, Palestinian pages by the tens of thousands. That's a lot of pages and a lot of people uh, to be purging from Facebook, but she was responsible for that. And now she sits on Facebook's uh, free speech advisory board or free, I think it's called free speech uh, court, I think it is, which is obviously ironic, but I just wanna thank you all for uh, joining me today. Um, this has been such an incredible conversation about uh, Israeli intelligence infiltration within social media. Uh, tech giants to censor Palestinian voices online. Suhair Nafal, thank you so much. Jessica, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, thank you I learned so, absolutely. I learned so much from both of you and from Mickey Huff. He's the director of Project Censored. And for everybody that's watching this, uh, help us beat social media algorithms. Um, Mint Press website is currently under attack by hackers. Uh, so just another reason to put your support behind independent journalism and media and activists as well. So make sure to subscribe to our Twitch channel, our Facebook, our YouTube, um, and our Twitter. I think I have to list like all of them every single time. But anyways, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.